Old Rambling House by Frank Herbert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Chenevere, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. On his last night on earth, Ted Graham stepped out of a glass walled telephone booth, ducked to avoid a swooping moth that battered itself in a frenzy against a bare globe above the booth. Ted Graham was a long-necked man, with a head of pronounced egg shape topped by prematurely balding sandy hair. Something about his lanky, intense appearance suggested his occupation, certified public accountant. He stopped behind his wife, who was studying a newspaper classified page, and frowned. They said to wait here. They'll come get us. Said the place is hard to find at night. Martha Graham looked up from the newspaper. She was a doll-faced woman, heavily pregnant, a kind of pink prettiness about her. The yellow glow from the light above the booth subdued the red auburn cast of her ponytail hair. "'I just have to be in a house when the baby's born,' she said. "'What did they sound like?' "'I don't know. There was a funny kind of interruption, like an argument in some foreign language.' Do they sound foreign? In a way. He motioned along the night-shrouded line of trailers toward one with two windows glowing amber. Let's wait inside. These bugs out here are fierce. Did you tell them which trailer is ours? Yes, they didn't sound anxious at all to look at it. That's odd. Them wanting to trade their house for a trailer? There's nothing odd about it. They've probably just got itchy feet like we did. He appeared not to hear her. Funniest sounding language you ever heard when that argument started. Like a squirt of noise. Inside the trailer, Ted Graham sat down on the green couch that opened into a double bed for company. They could use a good tax accountant around here, he said. When I first saw the place, I got that definite feeling. The valley looks prosperous. It's a wonder nobody's opened an office here before. His wife took a straight chair by the counter separating kitchen and living area, folded her hands across her heavy stomach. I'm just continental tired of wheels going around under me, she said. I want to sit and stare at the same view for the rest of my life. I don't know how a trailer ever seemed glamorous when... It was the inheritance gave us itchy feet, he said. Tires gritted on gravel outside. Martha Graham straightened. Could that be them? Awful quick, if it is. He went to the door, opened it, stared down at the man who was just raising a hand to knock. Are you Mr. Graham? asked the man. Yes. He found himself staring at the caller. I'm Clint Rush. You called about the house? The man moved farther into the light. At first he'd seemed an old man, fine wrinkled lines in his face, a tired leather look to his skin. But as he moved his head in the light, the wrinkles seemed to dissolve, and with them the years lifted from him. Yes, we called, said Ted Graham. He stood aside. Do you want to look at the trailer now? Martha Graham crossed to stand beside her husband. We've kept it in awfully good shape, she said. We've never let anything get seriously wrong with it. She sounds too anxious, thought Ted Graham. I wish she'd let me do the talking for the two of us. We can come back and look at your trailer tomorrow in daylight, said Rush. My car's right out here if you'd like to see our house. Ted Graham hesitated. He felt a nagging worry tug at his mind, tried to fix his attention on what bothered him. "'Hadn't we better take our car?' he asked. "'We could follow you.' "'No need,' said Rush. "'We're coming back into town tonight anyway. We can drop you off then.' Ted Graham nodded. "'Be right with you as soon as I lock up.' Inside the car, Rush mumbled introductions. His wife was a dark shadow in the front seat, her hair drawn back in a severe bun. Her features suggested gypsy blood. He called her Remy. 
Odd name, thought Ted Graham, and he noticed that she, too, gave that strange first impression of age that melted in a shift of light. Mrs. Rush turned her gypsy features toward Martha Graham. You are going to have a baby? It came out as an odd, veiled statement. Abruptly, the car rolled forward. Martha Graham said, It's supposed to be born in about two months. We hope it's a boy. Mrs. Rush looked at her husband. I have changed my mind, she said. Rush spoke without taking his attention from the road. It is too... He broke off, spoke in a tumble of strange sounds. Ted Graham recognized it as the language he'd heard on the telephone. Mrs. Rush answered in the same tongue, anger showing in the intensity of her voice. Her husband replied, his voice calmer. Presently, Mrs. Rush fell moodily silent. Rush tipped his head toward the rear of the car. My wife has moments when she does not want to get rid of the old house. It has been with her for many years. Ted Graham said, Oh. Then, are you Spanish? Rush hesitated. No, we are Bosque. He turned the car down a well-lighted avenue that merged into a highway. He turned onto a side road. There followed more turns, left, right, right. Ted Graham lost track. They hit a jolting bump that made Martha gasp. I hope that wasn't too rough on you, said Rush. We're almost there. The car swung into a lane, its lights picking out the skeleton outlines of trees. Peculiar trees. Tall gaunt leafless they added to ted graham's feeling of uneasiness the lane dipped ended at a low wall of a house red brick with celestory windows beneath overhanging eaves the effect of the wall and a wide beam door they could see to the left was ultra modern ted graham helped his wife out of the car followed the rushes to the door I thought you told me it was an old house, he said. It was designed by one of the first modernists, said Rush. He fumbled with an odd curved key. The wide door swung open onto a hallway equally wide, carpeted by a deep pile rug. They could glimpse floor-to-ceiling view windows at the end of the hall, city lights beyond. Martha Graham gasped, entered the hall as though in a trance. Ted Graham followed, heard the door close behind them. "'It's so, so, uh, so big!' exclaimed Martha Graham. "'You want to trade this for our trailer?' asked Ted Graham. "'It's too inconvenient for us,' said Rush. "'My work is over the mountains on the coast,' he shrugged. "'We cannot sell it.' Ted Graham looked at him sharply. "'Isn't there any money around here?' He had a sudden vision of a tax accountant with no customers. Plenty of money, but no real estate customers. They entered the living room. Sectional divans lined the walls. Subdued lighting glowed from the corners. Two paintings hung on the opposite walls, oblongs of odd lines and twists that made Ted Graham dizzy. Warning bells clamored in his mind. Martha Graham crossed to the windows, looked at the lights far away below. I had no idea we climbed that far, she said. It's like a fairy city. Mrs. Rush emitted a short, nervous laugh. Ted Graham glanced around the room, thought, If the rest of the house is like this, it's worth fifty or sixty thousand. He thought of the trailer. A good one, but not worth more than seven thousand. Uneasiness was like a neon sign flashing in his mind. This seems so... He shook his head. Would you like to see the rest of the house? asked Rush. Martha Graham turned from the window. Oh, yes. Ted Graham shrugged. No harm in looking, he thought. When they returned to the living room, Ted Graham had doubled his previous estimate on the house's value. His brain reeled with the summing of it, 
a solarium with an entire ceiling covered by sun lamps an automatic laundry where you drop soil clothing down a chute took it washed and ironed from the other end perhaps you and your wife would like to discuss it in private said rush we will leave you for a moment and they were gone before ted graham could protest martha graham said ted i honestly never in my life dreamed something's very wrong honey but ted this house is worth at least a hundred thousand dollars maybe more and they want to trade this he looked around him for a seven thousand dollar trailer ted they're foreigners and if they're so foolish they don't know the value of this place then why should i don't like it he said again he looked around the room recall the fantastic equipment of the house but maybe you're right he stared out at the city lights they had a lace-like quality tall buildings linked by lines of flickering incandescence something like a roman candle shot skyward in the distance okay he said if they want to trade let's go push the deal abruptly the house shuddered the city lights blinked out a humming sound filled the air martha graham clutched her husband's arm ted what what was that i don't know he turned uh, mr rush no answer only the humming the door at the end of the room opened a strange man came through he wore a short toga-like garment of gray metallic cloth belted at the waist by something that glittered and shimmered through every color of the spectrum an aura of coldness and power emanated from him a sense of untouchable hauteur he glanced around the room spoke in the same tongue the rushes had used ted graham said i don't understand you mister the man put a hand to his flickering belt both ted and martha graham felt themselves rooted to the floor a tingling sensation vibrating along every nerve again the strange language rolled from the man's tongue but now the words were understood who are you my name's graham this is my wife what's going how did you get here the rushes they wanted to trade us this house for our trailer they brought us now look we what is your talent your occupation tax accountant say why all these that was to be expected said the man clever oh excessively clever his hand moved again to the belt now be very quiet this may confuse you momentarily colored lights filled both the graham's minds they staggered you are qualified said the man you will serve where are we demanded martha graham the coordinates would not be intelligible to you he said i am of the rojack it is sufficient for you to know that you are under rojack sovereignty ted graham said but you have in a way been kidnapped and the ramis have fled to your planet an unregistered planet i'm afraid martha graham said shakily you have nothing to fear said the man you are no longer on the planet of your birth nor even in the same galaxy he glanced at ted graham's wrist that device on your wrist it tells your local time yes that will help in the search and your son can you describe its atomic cycle ted graham groped in his mind for his science memories from school from the sunday supplements i can recall that our galaxy is a spiral like most galaxies are spiral is this some kind of a practical joke asked ted graham the man smiled a cold superior smile it is no joke now i will make you a proposition ted nodded warily all right let's have the stinger the people who brought you here were tax collectors 
we Rojak recruited from a subject planet. They were conditioned to make it impossible for them to leave their job untended. Unfortunately, they were clever enough to realize that if they brought someone else in who could do their job, they were released from their mental bonds. Very clever. But you may have their job, said the man. Normally, you would be put to work in the lower echelons, but we believe in meeting out justice wherever possible. The Ramis undoubtedly stumbled on your planet by accident and lured you into this position without how do you know I can do your job? That moment of brilliance was an aptitude test. You passed. Well, do you accept? What about our baby? Martha Graham worriedly wanted to know. You will be allowed to keep it until it reaches the age of decision, about the time it will take the child to reach adult stature. Then what? insisted Martha Graham. The child will take its position in society according to its ability. Will we ever see our child after that? Possibly. Ted Graham said, What's the joker in this? Again the cold, superior smile. You will receive conditioning similar to that which we gave the Ramis, and we will want to examine your memories to aid us in our search for your planet. It would be good to find a new inhabitable place. Why did they trap us like this? asked Martha Graham. It's lonely work, the man explained. Your house is actually a type of space conveyance that travels along your collection route and there is much travel to the job, and then you will not have friends, nor time for much other than work. Our methods are necessarily severe at times. Travel? Martha Graham repeated in dismay. Almost constantly. Ted Graham felt his mind whirling, and behind him he heard his wife sobbing. The Ramis sat in what had been the Graham's trailer. For a few moments I feared he would not succumb to the bait, she said. I knew you could never overcome the mental compulsion enough to leave them there without their first agreeing. Remy chuckled. <laughs> yes, and now I'm going to indulge in everything the Rojack never permitted. I'm going to write ballads and poems. And I'm going to paint she said. Oh, the delicious freedom! Greed won this for us, he said. The long study of the Grahams paid off. They couldn't refuse the trade. I knew they'd agree. The looks in their eyes when they saw the house. They both had... She broke off, a look of horror coming into her eyes. One of them did not agree. They both did. You heard them. The baby? He stared at his wife. But, uh, but it is not at the age of decision. In perhaps eighteen of this planet's years, it will be at the age of decision. What then? His shoulders sagged. He shuddered. I will not be able to fight it off. I will have to build a transmitter, call the Rojack, and confess. And they will collect another inhabitable place, she said, her voice flat and toneless. I've spoiled it, he said. I've spoiled it. End of Old Rambling House by Frank Herbert End of Three Science Fiction Stories by Frank Herbert this recording was by Phil Chenevere in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I certainly hope you enjoyed it.